between all of the other things we've learned so far, um, seafloor spreading, continental drift, um, the the Vines and Matthews, all of those um, evidences put together came up with what we call plate tectonics, which is the current model of how the Earth um, plates move. So you, the basic idea is that there's these rigid plates um, that move along the surface of the Earth uh, that are made out of lithosphere, and they're in pieces. Uh, try to fit rock around anything spherical, you're going to get pieces. And that these plates interact with each other because they're moving due to uh, activity within the Earth's core, and that these plate interactions give rise to what we call tectonic activity, which is things like earthquakes and volcanoes and things of that nature. Um, these plates uh, have both are both oceanic and continental, and many plates have both continental rock and oceanic rock. Um, you should know uh, that oceanic rock is primarily basalt, and continental rock is... Um, it's a layer of granite on top of a layer of basalt. So moving forward, we're going to talk about um, plate boundaries in 2.3 quite a bit. And there are seven major plates, and you know from the last uh, quiz that there's actually um, eight minor plates. And they're both, um, most of the plates have both oceanic and continental crust um, of some amount somewhere. And almost all plate boundaries occur along the seafloor. Uh, if you were to look at them on land, they would look quite a bit different. So the three major types of plate boundaries are divergent, convergent, and transform, and they have to do with the direction of plate movement. There is a chart, uh, table 2.1 in your book, uh, that really summarizes this whole idea, and, and you'll be asked things related to this. And you can see that we have the three major plate boundaries, but that each one can be subdivided into um, different... Um, it says crust types, but I would say the way they interact. Uh, convergent plate boundaries have three, when ocean and continent meet, ocean and ocean meet, and continent and continent meet, and you get different features at each one. So I, I would spend some time, if I were you, actually looking at this crust, uh, crust, this chart about oceanic and continental crust and plate boundaries, and understanding um, features, the type of movement, and um, an example of each um, at a minimum. Uh, you will definitely see this again. So divergent plate boundaries are the ones we're going to talk about first. Um, the, ex the classic example is the mid-ocean ridge. They, uh, it's a looks like a chain of mountains that is dominated by what we call Rift Valley, which is this line basically that runs along the middle of the ridge that is, um, you know, where the lava comes out. It's a little deeper down. Divergent plate boundaries are places where plates are coming apart. Uh, they are pulled apart. Um, by the subduction at the other side of the plate. So we have a mantle plume usually underneath the plate, um, and the mantle is pulling the plate towards the other area. Um, you can see it in this diagram right here. Uh, right here, you have lava, some of it coming up, but some of it also moving to either side, and with it, it pulls the plate um, to the sides. Some people think that it's the rock coming up and forming that pushes the plate. Plates are much heavier than that. It takes a lot more um, force than that. Um, Seafloor spreading um, rates vary all over the planet, but we um, get new crust every year in this ridiculous amount right here. Um, 30 kilometers cubed of new crust every year, which is pretty much equal to how, how much is destroyed at other plate boundaries. So divergent plate boundaries, um, an area of immense amount of tectonic activity. This is um, also what we also call the Wilson cycle. I think I'll actually write that on here. Do, 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 Wilson. Um, a guy named Wilson came up with this cycle. Um, and what basically happens is that um, you have an area, frequently continental, where uh, a mantle plume suddenly arises or a plate is pushed over a hot um, a mantle plume and you get uh, warping of the surface and rifts actually begin to form. You can see the in here we have the uh, cracks forming and you it becomes an area of a uh, decent amount of volcanic activity. Over time it begins to rip apart and you get what we call um, a rift valley which can be seen right here which looks sort of like these plateaus with an area of crust um, that's ge geologically a little different looking than everything else around it. This is an example of what you would see uh, B. Was, you would see this if you actually looked at the East African Rift Valley in Africa, <coughs> where there's actually the first couple stages of the Wilson cycle occurring. 
And then um, eventually that area, the center of Rift Valley, becomes so low that water from nearby oceans um, rushes in and you get what we call a linear sea. And this is a very young ocean. The Red Sea is an example of this. And um, it's very young compared to the other only a couple millions of years old. And as time goes on, those plates move farther and farther apart and you get a full ocean basin. Um, Iceland is an island. And when we talk about hotspots, people frequently... Um, think of Iceland as a hotspot because it's an island and it's volcanic. That's not the definition definition of a hotspot. A, Iceland occur, is an example of a divergent plate boundary. Its volcanoes are all in a chain. Um, that's not true. Well, it's kind of true for hotspots. And it's basically an area where the mid-ocean ridge has come up um, to land. Um, and we call that continental rifting. And the mid-ocean ridge actually is right through the middle of Iceland. Half of Iceland is on the Atlantic plate, and or North American plate, and the other half of Iceland is on the Eurasian plate, which is kind of an interesting phenomenon. Um, it makes Iceland one of the most geologically active um, countries in the world. Uh, everybody there has free heat because all of the energy uh, for heating their homes comes from geothermal, which they have quite a bit of. Now, there's mid-ocean ridges can also be divided into two types. We have mid-ocean rises and mid-ocean ridges, and they're caused by different uh, seafloor spreading rates. One is very slow, um, and one is very fast. The oceanic rise is the fast one. It's gently sloping, and it's fast spreading. An example is the East Pacific rise, which would be, if we look at the picture underneath, doo -doo -doo. Um, where the Nazca and the Pacific meet, in this area, if you look at the picture underneath, um, you would find the East Pacific Rise. The mid-ocean ridge is very broad and very flat. Um, and that seems kind of weird. You would be like, well, if it's broad and flat, why is it fast spreading? Um, this is because as because the, the plates are spreading apart, there's never a chance for the magma to pile up. And its spreading rate is really fast, uh, 16 plus centimeters per year, which is, you hold your hands apart, it's almost, you know, pushing a foot. Oceanic ridges are taller and more rugged, and the mid-Atlantic ridge is a classic example. Um, what The average rate of that is only 2 centimeters a year. The, mid the Atlantic Ocean is growing about the same rate your hair and fingernails grow, uh, some of me, for some of you. And because it's slower, um, the plate movement is slower, as the magma comes out, it piles up into these uh, steeper and steeper structures, which is why it looks so different compared to the oceanic rise. And they can be very, very tall, uh, three kilometers above the seafloor. The mid-ocean ridge is a very large feature in the Atlantic Ocean. It has a very, very um, obvious rift valley um, that can be, compared to the size of the um, ridge around it, quite deep. And there are a handful of areas that we call ultra-slow spreading centers or ultra-slow spreading rates. Um, there's a famous one in the southwest Indian plate um, where they barely move at all. And here are um, two computer-coded uh, sonar images of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge versus the East Pacific Rise. And the East Pacific Rise has um, areas with seamounts. You can see them right here um, where you have actual mountains. But the, the plate itself is very flat, um, and there's a very weak ridge system in the middle. Whereas at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, it's much more mountainous, if you look at these areas on either side of the ridge, and the valley itself is much more prominent. So um, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is more mountainous looking because it is a um, slower spreading rate. So divergent plate boundaries, the earthquakes associated with them. Before we talk about earthquake, we should probably talk about the Richter scale. Um, everybody talks about the Richter scale. Whoops, something jumped around there. The Richter scale, oh, it's a 9.0. Um, what they actually usually use is seismic moment magnitude, or the MW scale. Um, and it's more representative of the amount of energy <clears throat> that's being released during a tectonic event. So plate boundaries um, have different types of associated earthquakes. And because um, it's uh, inversely proportional to the rate. So the faster that um, a plate is spreading apart from another plate, the less energy is released um, because more of it is released in a continuous stream. There's never a chance for it to build up. Um, so an example at the Mid-Ocean Ridge, the typical earthquake is around 6.0, 
and um, well, it, at the East Pacific Rise, it's more like a 4.5. Both of these are going to be lower than the type of um, earthquakes we see when we're talking about uh, convergent plate boundaries. Those can have much stronger earthquakes. We'll talk about convergent plate boundaries in the next video.